Hello everybody, this is Lucy Nathanson, child therapist and founder of Confident Children of Coda UK. So I'm super excited that we have Max here today and Max has personal experience of having selective mutism. So it's, I'm really happy that she'll be sharing her story and her experience with us today. I did actually do an interview with Jess a few months ago and Jess also had selective mutism and that video was really well received and it was so amazing to hear first-hand experience of the experience of selective mutism. So if you want to also see Jess's video after this video, have a look on my YouTube channel. That video is called Reflections on Having Selective Mutism. So before we get started, just to let you know that Max prefers the term situational mutism rather than selective mutism. So she'll be using the phrase situational mutism throughout this video. And I also do have a video called why selective mutism should be called situational mutism. So if you want to check out that video as well, please feel free to do so. So thank you so much, Max, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. So before we get started, please, could you introduce yourself, share with us a bit about your background and perhaps what your mission is? Sure. Um, yeah, so I am a biracial Chinese American writer, speaker and advocate for intersectional trauma recovery. Um, so I first fell in love with intersectional trauma healing at age 19. Um, just around when I uh, left my Chinese American fundamentalist church, um, I came out to my immigrant parents and I started recovering from situational mutism all around the same time. Um, and so now through my blog and my Instagram page, which is Max Gets Curious, um, I create content that encourages survivors of racial, queer, spiritual, and disability traumas. Um, and that does include um, situational mutism advocacy too. So yeah, SM is something that is really close to my heart, um, especially ever since I started sharing my story and realizing that there are a lot of other stories out there too. Um, so thank you for having me on. Really excited my to pleasure. get it. Thank that you so much. Mm -hmm. And I'll put the link to Max's blog, Max Gets Curious, in the, section, in the comments below for anyone who wants to delve deeper into her content. So Max, could you please start off by giving us an idea of how, your experience of selective mutism or SM as a child? So in what situations could you speak and in which situations were you unable to speak and to, to whom as well? Yeah, um, I guess we can start with the, um, the timeline of my SM. So I have memories of um, growing up with mute episodes um, pretty much as far back as I can remember, but I don't really have any records of when it first began. Um, we know that the average age of onset is between like two and four years of age. So if I had to throw the dart somewhere, it'd be probably around there. Um, so I experienced SM from the time that I was in elementary school to up around a few years ago. And I just turned 23. So that's the majority of my life um, as a child, as a teenager, and now as a young adult that I have experienced muteness. Um, and I think that gives me a full perspective um, as an SM advocate because there's so much research and treatment and advocacy that focuses on children nowadays, which is, you know, really important. But um, part of my advocacy is reminding folks that children with SM will grow up to be teenagers and, and young adults with SM if they don't receive the inclusion and support that they need. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, that is part of my story. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for highlighting that as well. Because as you say, there's, you know, I receive emails as well from adults and they mm -hmm. say, I know that you specialize in selective medicine and your website is Confident Children, but right. where can yeah. I go? Yeah, and exactly. It's, oh, there's <laughs> this real gap or... Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So you say about two to four is when you first started to experience SM. So were you unable to speak at school or was it with extended family, what could, could you? Could yeah, so um, I remember being mute as a kid, mostly um, at school or sometimes in church or um, around groups of people who I didn't know. And um, it seemed really arbitrary at first when I would 
be mute. Um, and it was always this really kind of like immediate um, involuntary reaction. Um, and up until age 19, I never had an explanation for what was going on with me. Mm. So um, when we think of SM, usually the first thing that jumps to mind is the speechlessness, right? Situational mutism. But for me, um, it was also the sensitivity to noise and, um, you know, a, lo a lot of trouble with other forms of communication too. So it felt really impossibly difficult to make eye contact with people or um, to like show my facial expressions or to nod yes or shake my head no or laugh at what was going on around me and I would be really stiff. Um, and then also I, I couldn't speak. So uh, when I mute, it feels like my, my throat physically tightens up and no matter how much I want to speak with all my heart, I can shape the words with my mouth and nothing will come out. Um, and the way that I usually describe it is, um, it's like the middle, the little mermaid in, in Earth, and um, uh, like when the little mermaid gives her voice to Ursula, um, or that kind of like really intense stage fright that you see in movies when the character goes up on stage to deliver their lines and then um, they freeze up and they can't say a single word. It's, it's like that, but in everyday situations. Um, so for instance, for years in school, um, I would sharpen my pencil um, on, in a screw on the back of my chair because um, I was too scared to go to like the electric pencil sharpener. It was such an ordeal for me because the sound of like the sharpener was just so loud. It was totally overwhelming. Um, so I would just sharpen my pencil using like the back of my chair, which is not effective at all, but um, that's what I had to do. Um, or yeah. I would sit the whole day without going to the bathroom or um, without fully understanding a lesson because raising my hand felt too terrifying. Um, or I would get zeros on my homework because I would miss the instructions on where to turn it in, even though I'd totally done it. And then I, you know, I would get late marks or it wouldn't be counted or something like that. Um, and then uh, the last example that I have is um, Christmas time. So my fam, I don't know if other families do this, I'm kind of curious, but my family kind of makes it like a big to do for the kids uh, when they receive their presents. Cause like my family just kind of forms this like circle around <laughs> the person oh, who's gosh. open to the present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the parents, yeah they like get out their cameras and then uh, we're back in the day we had like the big um video recorders and then they'll like take all these pictures of your reactions so oh we have with sm <laughs> i um found this to be like a really horrible experience um so i would um instead of ripping open the presents um the sound of like tearing open um, gift paper was too much for me too. So I would just remove the tape from each side and then kind of um, unfold <laughs> the wrapping paper and save it for later, um, which my family thought was really funny. <laughs> and I, I guess in retrospect it is, but it wasn't because I was like type A or like really into sustainability. I was just, um, I just had a lot of anxiety. So um, that was, yeah, that's, those are just snapshots of my experience with SM as a kid. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Especially the physical sensation that you experienced in those moments, because children often do say that their throat yeah. feels blocked or yeah. it's, you know, I can't talk. And it's, yeah. hearing it from an adult, you know, in retrospect mm -hmm. is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I experienced as a kid as a teenager and as a young adult, but as a child, um, <clears throat> I didn't have like the language for that. I mean, as a kid, um, I think this is pretty typical with kids, but like, I wasn't really aware of my body. Like I couldn't read my body signals. And so I didn't, I, I like didn't have that thought that like, you know, I physically can't speak. Um, but then as I grew older, I started to become aware that, um, that was part of the equation. Yeah, great. And also you highlighted that SM is so much more than just speech. Yeah. The sounds mm -hmm. cause anxiety for you. Also, you know, the physical action of putting your hand up, it was mm -hmm. scary, drawing mm -hmm. attention to you. Yeah. So yeah, that's another kind of misconception yeah. that, you know, the name is um, yeah. leading. 
I think it depends on the person. Some people will appear to be totally um, at ease, but then they have, you know, the speechlessness aspect. And, and then other people will just be like straight as a board, like not showing any facial expression. And I think that that was me. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so broad. I suppose maybe a name wouldn't be able to encapsulate because there are children who I work with who simply are unable to talk, but they're mm -hmm. not showing those other symptoms, whereas mm -hmm. other children yeah. have a lot of additional symptoms which fall under the SM. So yeah. it's a condition that is quite unique in a way that is, yeah. because it's so individual. Yeah, it's really interesting. Very individual. Yeah. Great. So thank you for sharing how um, you experienced SM. So when you were going through all of this, how did people in your life respond to that? Your family, teachers, peers, and so on? Yeah, so I think this is the most difficult question for me to answer by far, because um, when people are not educated about what SM is, they very often place blame or take advantage of those who have SM. And that was the case for me. Um, I grew up in a Chinese American immigrant family and in a non-denominational Chinese American born again fundamentalist-ish church. And um, because of both my parents' upbringing and our religion, uh, mental health was not really something that we could openly discuss. Um, I, I mean, it was, it took years for um, my family or my church to be able to openly talk about depression, which is such a common mental illness, right? And so um, SM was definitely not something that anyone in my circle had heard of or been educated about. So that lack of awareness, which was tied both into our faith and our culture, kind of really colored my lifelong experiences with SM. And um, in my mind, I kind of split that experience into two categories. And the first is kind of like the internal experience that that I had as a result of my own lack of awareness of SM. And then the second one is um, my experience with others who, who responded to me without awareness of SM. Um, so when I was growing up and I, I didn't know about SM, I had, I had just like, no, I had nothing. Like I had no explanation for why I couldn't sharpen my pencils or ask questions or blow my nose. And I knew that in other situations, I could do those things perfectly fine. So my natural assumption was that this is my fault. Like this is a character flaw. This is a lack of courage. This is just me being shy and I need to break out of my shell. And if I don't, then it's because I don't want it enough. And I'm selfish and I viewed SM as a sin. The thing about SM is that it's already such a hard experience to put to words sometimes, right? Because it's involuntary, just like we have the fight or flight response in life. We also have the fawn and freeze responses. And SM is really like a freeze response. Mm -hmm. um, I have this information from Dr. Elisa Shippon Bloom from the SMART Center. So if anyone is interested in learning more about um, this aspect of SM, then um, I definitely recommend checking out her website. Um, but there's current research that hypothesizes that people who have SM tend to have really um, severely inhibited temperaments. And we also know from research that people who have inhibited temperaments, whether they have SM or not, tend to have more sensitive amygdalas, which is that almond-shaped um, area of the brain that sets off our bodily responses to danger. So um, SM is kind of this protective freeze response to situations that feel really overwhelming to us because our brains are literally more sensitive to feeling unsafe mm. or overwhelmed. And that's what triggers this immediate bodily shutdown because sometimes our brains identify the people around us as overwhelming, even if we know that that's not the reality. So we can't make eye contact, we can't show facial expressions or move, we, we can't speak. Um, and no matter 
what we are thinking up here that can't magically cure what is going on in our, our bodies and our brains. And there's a hypothesis that because we have that more intense nervous system response to danger, our vocal muscles actually like physically tighten up or become paralyzed, which was really interesting for me to learn about because I have had that sensation. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know any of that when I was young. Um, all I knew was mm -hmm. what I experienced, which was powerlessness. And it was like every single day there was this um, ticker tape reeling by that only I could see of all of the things that I wanted to do but couldn't. And um, like I wanted to say hi to this person. I wanted to um, crack a joke in this conversation. Um, I wanted to go sharpen my pencils, but um, I wasn't able to do those things. And um, even though I knew, you know, in all the past seconds of, of this day, I've wanted to do all of these things and I couldn't, but this time I'm gonna do it. And um, the moment would come and then the moment would pass and I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do and I would do it all again. And it would continue like that, just like day after day for, for years, for, for the majority of my life in some situations. And so when you don't have any kind of um, framework for why something like that, that's so frustrating and confusing and, um, and just um, disempowering, um, if you don't have an understanding of why that's happening to you, I mean, I internalize the blame for it. And I, I don't even know if I can describe the depth of the impact that that had on my mental health um, for most of my life, let alone my self-esteem. Mm. And um, I, I would have like existential crises every time I took a personality test because I had it in my head that being quiet was bad, that it was a character flaw or that it made me a burden. And um, so whenever the, I took a personality test and it was like, you're introverted, um, I would take it as kind of this verdict on my self-worth. Um, I really blamed myself for my own solitary confinement. Um, so that is one dimension of my experience of the consequences of lack of awareness the internal consequences, which is how I, I treated myself. And then the other half of it is how others treated me when they had no education about SM. Um, and there are two different kinds of, of treatment by others that I wanna share. Um, the first is the outright negative. <laughs> um, in middle school, we had this National History Day presentation where it's basically you choose whatever topic you want, you make this, um, this little trifold that kind of um, explains all the research you've done. And you're like in middle school, so it's kind of like a cute thing. Um, and I had chosen the history of the communist revolution in China. I don't know why I did this, but <laughs> um, if I could choose a different topic now, it would definitely not be, be that. But um, I, yeah, I, I put like this red tablecloth over my uh, trifold and I like decorate. I thought it was so creative. But when we went into the gym to do all of our, our presentations, I got smacked with this big wave of nausea. And um, I like couldn't speak because I was like, I'm going to throw up. Um, and I think that is connected to SM also. So when people would kind of um, drift by or stop in front of my project, I wouldn't respond to them because I was like, I don't want to throw up on you. Um, and I remember these two girls stopped in front of me and um, I couldn't say anything. And they were asking questions. and. Um, all these things and eventually they um they got upset and they said um like hello can you speak what's wrong with you um and then eventually they left and um that was really common for me um people would get bored with me <clears throat> they would give up on me they would uh be offended by me and when those people are not just your peers, but people who are in authority, then that's a whole other story. Because um, I, I would be punished for not speaking. I was labeled stubborn or rude or antisocial or arrogant, which I know that a lot of other people with SM have had that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I already blamed myself for being mute. So all of this um, response from other people around me kind of just reinforced those beliefs, even though I still clung onto this belief that deep down I was actually a friendly, goofy, good person. And I, I think that that is what saved me. But um, 
yeah, there were a lot of comments like that. Um, the worst comment that um, I talk about in my advocacy, because I think that it's useful, um, is one person in my life just didn't understand why I was mute. They would just sit with me and wait until I apologize or until I said like, okay, or, or whatever, what have you. And um, I just remember staring at the clock and seeing how much time would pass by um, before I could say anything. Cause it wasn't that I was being stubborn. It was just that I had SM. Um, <clears throat> and one thing that that person said once was, um, what are you, a piece of furniture? And I think that um, it's kind of ironic because growing up with SM, constantly feeling like a ghost in the room. I grew up seeing almost seeing myself almost as this non-playable character in a video game, like a piece of furniture. And um, that's why a huge part of my my healing um, has been learning to be has been learning to be the main character of my life. Um, to um, understand that the way that others treated me, um, you know, was wrong. And I think that this is something that I, I haven't heard talked about much in the SM advocacy world. And um, it's something that I talk about in my work on intersectional trauma healing. I call it disability trauma. Um, and trauma is a mind body response to a distressing lack of a loss of safety or loss of agency that overwhelms our ability to cope, whether that's an actual experience that we have or the threat of an experience. And I think that there is very real trauma that can result from experiences related to disability, whether that's the experience of the disability itself or the way that we are treated and ignored and systemically excluded because of our disability. And um, so the experiences that I described are things that I'm still working through myself. And it's one reason why I'm so invested in my advocacy because I know um, what can happen when um, when the person who has SM and the people around them don't have any awareness of what it is. Mm. Um, and that kind of takes me to the second kind of experience that I've had, which is kind of the good news. Um, <laughs> and um, so when I was still in school, my class was working on this assignment and the teacher was kind of circulating the room to check on all of us. And um, she came around to my table and even though I loved her and she was so kind, I couldn't respond to her questions because that's just when my SM came up. And um, I was really ready for her to get frustrated with me or confused or just, you know, just kind of move on. Mm -hmm. But um, when she realized that um, talking was hard for me, she asked, um, is it kind of hard for you to talk right now? And then um, she asked if we could write to each other instead. So I tried and it was still hard, but <laughs> um, we managed to do it. So we just wrote to each other on a piece of paper. Wow. And that was the first time that I learned without having the words for it yet that I, um, I wasn't voiceless. Having SM didn't make me voiceless. It just made me speechless. I always had a voice and in, in, um, talking was just one way to use it. And actually, if others had the kindness and imagination to recognize that I had a voice and that speaking was only one way to use it, then things might be so much better. Mm -hmm. um, and something like that happened fairly recently for me, too. Um, I was studying abroad in New Zealand. I think I was like 20 or something. And um, I went to a drag show with some friends. And for some reason, I had... Um, a mute episode afterwards. I don't know why, but um, I was really embarrassed because I hadn't told my friends about SM. And um, I, um, I tried to hide it because I didn't know how to explain it to them. And um, regardless, one of my friends at the table was really perceptive. <laughs> and um, they, I can't remember if they asked me or like typed this out on their phone. Um, but they asked me this question, do you want distraction or do you want space? And mm -hmm. nobody had ever asked me what I wanted before. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, yeah, it was kind of a life-changing experience. Um, and they sat with me the whole time and um, I can't even remember if I actually explained SM or if I just didn't explain and they were fine with it anyway. Um, but they, yeah, they didn't get bored of me they didn't get upset with me they were just with me and um 
they walked me down to my house um, at the end of the night because we all kind of lived on the same terrace. And um, even though it was still hard for me to speak, this friend gave me this like big hug, like one of those hugs that like communicates something, you know what I mean? That like, I care about you. And um, remember that I just like welled up with tears because it was, it was a really nice hug. Um, and it was, it was a really nice experience. Um, and I still hold that night with me because it was really affirming and healing. Um, after some of the disability trauma that I have carried after a lifetime of people not responding that way. Um, so it, it really showed me that that is what po is possible when others care, when we put inclusion and unconditional care before our own need for um, comfort or, or for having other people voice themselves the way that we are accustomed to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's one of my favorite advocacy stories because I think it really shows, um, I don't know if you've heard of, um, there's this project and a hashtag called Access is Love. And um, it was created by Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, and um, Sandy Ho, which was, who was my mentor, I think a year or two ago. Um, and they are three Asian American disability activists. And the project is, um, well, the idea behind it is that accessibility is an act of love. So um, accessibility is not something that um, we should see as a burden or a legal duty, but um, it, it's a collective responsibility to show love to each other as, as family members, as educators, as therapists, as neighbors, society members. Um, and I think that is really important with SM because um, sometimes I think people with SM and um, pe people who know someone with SM might view accommodations for SM as um, all of the things that I listed as, as a burden, as a duty, as you know, something that makes their life a little bit more complicated. Um, but I think the reality is, you know, like as the, the two stories that I shared show, um, when we take the time to to include one another and to to ask people with SM what they need, it it is an act of love that's mm -hmm. felt. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I just yeah. You take a moment. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. It just highlights how in. You know, the first step, and this is something I say all the time, the first step to helping a child is understanding and empathy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just highlights that, you know, having that understanding stance and coming from a place of, you know, this person isn't choosing not to talk, which is just the most ridiculous yeah. misconception. Yeah. <laughs> um, but coming from that place of, you know, of understanding, this person is going through something really horrible you know that it's it's we need to be there as a as a support not, mm -hmm. rather than seeing it as a um as yeah so it's thank you so much for sharing that and to this day one of my earliest youtube videos called the do's mm -hmm. and don'ts when interacting with a child with selective yeah. mutism that video is still my most popular video and it's one That's of the crazy. first ones i did yeah because it was just it, for me it was so um obvious things like don't make <laughs> don't uh, force a child to make eye contact with you right. um don't tell them to talk yeah. <laughs> um if they do talk just act normally and respond to what they say yeah so these, <laughs> these things are just you know just responding to them in a understanding empathetic way um but yeah it's so it's such a needed message because mm -hmm. some people don't yeah may not realize yeah so thank That's you for sharing. Of, yeah, I, I think it's some. It's just the simplest things that can change everything. Sometimes. Absolutely, and your teacher set writing that note to you, saying, you know, you don't have to say it with words. You can write to me. It's mm -hmm. just meeting you where you're at. Exactly. That's what you're about. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. <laughs> um, so, you've shared how you felt and the depth of that which has been amazing to hear so 
but you also mentioned a few times that you didn't realize that you had SM. So when did you, when did you realize that you had SM? Uh, I think I was 19. Oh, wow. I was in college. Um, I don't remember what year it was. Well, I was taking summer classes and, um, we were on the bus. We were taking a trip to New York, uh, my summer class. And, um, I really liked everyone in the class and we really got along. Um, but for some reason, just buses, I guess, are, it's really difficult for me to, to talk to people on transportation. That was like always one of my SM rules. Um, and so like when, while we were on the bus, everyone was kind of just like socializing and like chatting and everything. Cause like it's, it's a trip from, from Boston to New York, to New York. So it's um, a decent amount of time. Um, and I was just like sitting in my seat and um, I wasn't going over to them or, or talking to them, even though I wanted to. And I was like, why is this happening to me? Like I'm perfectly capable of doing this but I'm not doing it. And this, I mean, this has happened so many times before. Um, but I think for some reason it was just that, that day that, that like all of my um, frustration and confusion and, and all of the things that I'd lived with around SM I just came up and I was like, I need to find out like why this is happening to me. So, um, I pulled out my phone and I went to Google and um, I don't remember what I Googled. It was probably something like, I want to speak, but I can't sometimes or something like that. Um, but eventually I got to a website about SM and I was reading about it and I was like, these things, these things don't describe me. And then um, the more that I thought about it, the more I was like, wait, this actually does kind of feel similar to my experience. And then um, the more I read and then the more I kind of surfed around on the internet and um, looked at Facebook groups and things like that, the more it just sounded really familiar to me. And um, I kind of described the realization that I had SM as like a lightning bolt. It was, it was a very transformative moment in my life um, because for so long, like, I really, I just didn't know that that was a thing. Like, I didn't know that there was a whole explanation for what was going on in my, my brain, in my body for, you know, what was happening to me that it wasn't my fault, despite what I had always believed and what everyone else I think had always believed. And, um, so that was, yeah, that was crazy. Um, <laughs> but I, so I started getting involved in, in the Facebook groups after that of people who have SM. And it was so crazy just being plugged into like this group of people who also experienced what I experienced. It was really great and just kind of um, opened up a whole new world for me. Um, so yeah, so that's when I learned at age 19. And <laughs> I think that's my part of, part of why my advocacy is so important to me because I would prefer that other people would learn about SM earlier than age 19. Um, but yeah, that was, that was how I did it. The power of the internet. Um, wow. <laughs> so up until that point, so, you know, your whole school career, no one had picked it up. A teacher hadn't or a, there was. Yeah, no. Um, I think that, I, I had heard the phrase selective mutism a f maybe a few years before I was 19, uh, but it just never clicked for me because I didn't, it was, I think it was like just the phrase. Mm -hmm. And the phrase selective mutism sounds like intentional mutism, right? So that, that just didn't make any sense for me sure. um, until I learned more about it. Sure. So you didn't receive any help no throughout the school wow yeah, That's yeah so I never received um a formal diagnosis or or treatment mm. so I, mm. I know that my story is a little unorthodox mm. so from then did you did you receive help then or what was the process after you realized that you had sm how did you work towards starting to overcome it and did you face any challenges along the way i think that a lot of it was um, my own research because 
Um, I talked to my therapist, I had a therapist at the time and, um, I talked to her about it and, um, she either, I can't remember, either she wasn't very familiar with it or she hadn't heard of it before. Um, or maybe she was, she just wanted to hear what I had to say about it. I don't know. Um, (laughs) but regardless, I kind of, um, I did my research. I talked to my therapist about it. I explained, what SM was to her and um, like how I experienced it. And we never real. I don't know if we really ever focused specifically on SM and therapy. So my process of recovery was kind of just something that I, that I did myself, which I also know is very unorthodox. Um, I think I did a lot of the work gradually, like over time, up until that point, I had already been gradually recovering from SM. Um, I know that there's kind of this whole debate around um, changing schools for kids with SM. Um, well, at least a lot of parents have asked me about it. <laughs> um, and, and I also have a, sorry, just, I have a video um, on YouTube oh, yeah. called, Shall I Change My Child's School? If anyone's oh, interested in my views on that. As, um, yeah, and it's a case-by-case decision, of course, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, to no, I'm, I'm glad to know it, because now I'll just direct people to that video. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I... For me, changing schools was uh, a part of my recovery because I had this really um, strong internal like drive to kind of um, be more than than how others saw me and how I saw myself because I mentioned that I had this you know this this idea that deep down I was this like friendly good good person that I had my own personality right that I wasn't like the weird, rude, quiet girl. <laughs> and um, I, I clung really hard to that because I think that that, that's, that was my power, just like holding on to hope. And so every time I would change, it's like a, a social environment. So like every time I went from elementary to middle school or middle school to high school and then high school to college, I would be like, okay, I have a clean slate right now. Nobody knows me. So I can kind of create my own reputation. And I think that um, part of SM is that it is continually environmentally reinforced. So like the longer that you can't or don't speak, the longer that the, um, the more others don't expect you to do those things. So if you do get to a point where you can do those things, then you'll be met with a lot of attention. Um, and that's what you don't want when you have exactly. SM. Um, at least in in this situation where you are mute, you don't want well, you don't you don't want attention. So um, it was it made it really difficult for me to recover when when I had that reputation. So I went to an, when I went to a new place where people didn't know me, I would just get a little bit better at um, being able to socialize, or I I just put forth this like um really big spurt of energy to kind of get out there and have conversations and create relationships before um you know like the muteness kind of came in um or despite it I don't really know how I don't know this the the logic behind my recovery um but yeah I the the biggest leap for me was high school to college because um I was better in high school than I was in middle school. I was better in middle school than I was in elementary school. But then when I went to college, I was like, okay, this is like my last shot. So when I went to college, um, I was talking to everybody. I was really friendly and um, I was really happy because I I was at college and um, that was really um, enjoyable time in my life, Um, like the, the orientation freshman year. And so I was able to create that new reputation for myself that then made it easier for me to recover. But um, when it came to actually um, tackling the more ingrained parts of my SM, um, like the different rules that I had, I, I did this thing where I challenged myself to do one thing that scared me every day. And um, for example, One SM rule that I had was you can't shout hi or like 
say hi to someone from far off. They have to be in front of you. So it felt impossible for me to like say hi to my friends if I saw them like walking along. So um, one day that was just, that was like my, I decided that was my thing for the day when it happened in the moment. Um, Cause I saw my friend and I was like, it feels really ridiculous that I can't say hi to this friend. And I under, now I understand why I can't do it, but I'm going to, I'm just going to see if I can. And um, I almost tried to like separate my, my body from my, I don't know how to explain how I did it, but I just, um, like the word came out of my mouth involuntarily and the, and like the act of myself physically saying hi to my friend was like really shocking. I couldn't believe I did it, but it also sh kind of showed me that, that, that it was okay, that it was possible. And, um, just different things like that, like putting myself in that situation and, and seeing if it was possible for me to try it or if it was physically possible for me to do. I think maybe somehow that like loosened something in my brain that, that showed me that like physically, mm -hmm. like being in my body, I would see in wow. this, in this situation. Yeah, so I possible. wish I could explain it more like clearly, but I, yeah, I still don't really know how to describe what happened. <laughs> it sounds like you have really took almost ownership of what you wanted to achieve and it's it's basically graded exposure of you know pushing yourself and but you had that within you to do it yourself and give yourself these daily challenges which is amazing because our um default is to avoid what we find yep. scary and what is really hard. <laughs> exactly and that yeah. is the you know the the natural response is for us to avoid whereas you yeah. pushed yourself even though it was so hard. I think it's because I just came to this point of like desperation. Like I, like I just lived like that for so long that I like, I just like needed to change. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that um, people who cannot um, make the recovery gains that they, who have not made the recovery gains that they want to, I'm not saying that that's because they have a lack of um, will or determination at all um because I like I had all the will and determination for <laughs> most of my life and that doesn't um that that doesn't magically cure you right but I think that um of course. I don't know for me that that was part of the equation that I I just needed I really yeah. needed to give it my all yeah absolutely yeah and also it was really um great that you mentioned about you know changing schools helped um because one part of um you know why it's so hard for ch i work with children for children to speak mm -hmm. or i'm sure with adults as well is when there's that um and share your experience this when there's that already that association of i don't talk here they haven't heard my voice yet and it's and it's that history of not being able to talk in this situation and th and that's almost going to be like trapping mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. children often um when they go on holiday to a brand new place, they can suddenly mm -hmm. talk in the shops and supermarkets and the parents are like, but you don't do that in yeah. our local, you've never spoken. With freedom. <laughs> local yeah. yeah, exactly. Because they, they don't know that I don't talk here. Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. I so, had one memory like that. Yeah, I, I um, man, I don't remember what, what exactly it was. It was some kind of health related, like uh, group that my, um, my parents brought my, my brother and I to. And um, I think I was in high school and uh, we like kind of split up into this like small group and um, yeah, I, I definitely used like situations with people I didn't know at that point as kind of experiments on like the kinds of the kind of person that I could present myself as, which I mean, all teenagers do that. Right. But also um, because I was, I was like free of the reputation that I had. So I was like, I can talk to these people and I can, you know, I can see what their impression is of me. And I remember uh, one of the women was like, do you want, like, she was asking if I was interested in a leadership position. Cause she was like, you seem like a leader to me. Like you don't seem quiet. And that was really affirming for me. Cause mm -hmm. I grew up with people thinking that I was really timid and didn't have any personality, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, people can be really surprised um, at how, people with SM act and, and how like their personality can come out. Yes. In these 
hundred percent. Actually, yeah. only today I was having an online session, a therapy session with a child, and by the end, the child was, you know, so we'd gone through the point where she was able to talk to me, and it was almost oh. like she was had this rush of adrenaline and was being really <laughs> like. And the mum said that she never shows that side of her. Her yeah. mum hasn't seen her show that playful, like funny personality because she's always, you know, in school yeah. so scared. Oh. So like you say, when you feel comfortable, that side can shine. Yeah, that's really sweet. <laughs> um, so having experienced this, um, this journey and having experience the recovery and learning about SM is there anything you'd like to share with with us yeah um I think so I, I started to learn about SM at 19 and I think um being involved with those Facebook groups and meeting other people with SM really um like lit a spark in me to ask myself like why didn't why did I know about this growing up and like how could that have changed my life if I if I knew about SM and and also like all these other people are having these negative experiences both like with like internally and also like the way other people are treating them and um when I was I oh my god why am I I just graduated and I can't remember which year this was I think it was senior year I did um a disability policy internship no, it was a fellowship. Um, that's when I um, <clears throat> I worked with Sandy Ho, who is one of the creators of Access is Love. And um, that's where I learned about the social model of disability, which is the idea that disability um, um, is not always, hmm, how do I describe this? The social model of disability um, draws attention to the fact that um, our environment is also disabling or also inaccessible when you have a disability. Um, for example, is it disabling to use a wheelchair or to use a wheelchair in a society that doesn't have any ramps, right? So um, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but there is a lot of, if you look up social model of disability, there's a lot of really great information out there um, written by disability activists who um, for decades have been talking about this. So um, I learned about that from several other SM advocates who had lived with SM. And then also from um, the fellowship I did, it's, um, it was a fellowship at the Lori Institute of Disability Policy at Brandeis. And um, I went to this conference and um, it was about um, disability rights. And um, there are so many people there, like, who lived with disability but they like when I when I was there I just I had never been part of a community of people who had disabilities who were unapologetic and um like I got business cards that were stamped in braille like I um went to a gym that was completely accessible for people with disabilities, which I'd never seen before. I saw people, um, you know, we had like sign language interpreters for um, every talk, which is not something that I often see just in society in general. Um, and when I was studying abroad in New Zealand, I took a class on sign language. Um, so I learned a little bit of New Zealand sign language. And um, that was also a really transformative experience for me because our teacher was really funny. <laughs> she was, she would make us laugh like every class without saying a word. Um, and she also taught us sign language without ever saying a word. And um, it showed me that, um, you know, like a, your voice is something that you can embody. Something like she had so, our teacher had so much spirit, she had so much personality, and she expressed it through sign language rather than speaking, and wow. um, yeah, when I was taking this class, I also learned about the history of, um, of uh, what is it called, autism. One of my followers told me about this when I was posting about my SM story, like maybe a year ago. Um, autism is kind of the belief that speaking is the best form of communication above all others, which I, I do see reflected in some SM treatment 
approaches. Um, but yeah, we learned about the history of that um, in New Zealand for deaf children who were prevented from like using sign language, which they created to communicate with each other. They were forced to speak out loud, even though that communication method was just useless for them because they couldn't hear what they were saying to each other. Um, and so sign language, you know, access to sign language is seen as a right now. Um, and when I was kind of um, learning about all like this history and then also learning to express myself through sign language and uh, meeting this teacher and then I went to this conference, I kind of all came together for me, this, like, this concept that um, I was never voiceless when I had SM. I was just speechless and that's why I started to talk about my SM experience with the hashtag um, speechless not voiceless. Um, because, I mean, writing, using sign language, using, um, like, pointing, gesturing, um, any of those things are also forms of expressing ourselves. And um, something that is documented in um, a book by I Speak, it's by um, Carl Sutton and Cheryl Forrester, who run I Speak, which is an organization by and for people with SM. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's completely by and for, um, but the purpose is to elevate the voices of people with SM. And um, something that they, they document in their book, um, In Our Own Words, um, which is about, it's an anthology of experiences with selective mutism. They talk about how people with SM are often very creative, like we paint and we write and we sing, create videos. Um, and those are all ways of expressing our voices too. So um, I just, part of the, the like main um, mission of my advocacy around SM, I think, is to center our voices more. Um, mm. Not our heard voices, but our, our voices as they are. Wow, thank you for sharing that. As you say, expression, you know, there are many ways that we can express ourselves, not yeah. necessarily just through speech. Yeah. And for children or for people with SM, those other methods may be accessible even when they're unable to talk perhaps so of course you're in your early 20s so much is ahead of you um so what are your hopes and aspirations for the future um well one of my really big goals i would love if this could happen but um i i don't know if this is as as feasible now during the pandemic but i would love to speak at um conferences for sm one day i know that um situational mut uh, sorry selective mutism association and um smira in the uk have their own conferences um on sm um so i would love to speak at a conference and just share you know some of my experiences and um the message that um it's important to center all of our expressions of voice in SM advocacy. And then um, I also um, want to continue creating resources for kids and, and people who have SM, as well as the people who um, love us and work with us. And um, I'd also like to um, study SM as an aspiring MSW, because I would like to get my, um, I would like to become like a licensed social worker um, and a therapist. And um, so when I was a senior, I wrote this study proposal comparing um, <clears throat> the etiologies, like the, the, um, the causes or origins of um, situational mutism and eating disorders and looking at the different proposed factors that go into each of them. They are a little bit similar. Um, although the disorders themselves don't look alike. Um, yeah, and then I, um, I also do write and speak about queer trauma, racial trauma, and um, religious trauma, so I do that as well. Yeah, right, amazing, thank you. And what would be your key message for people who currently have SM? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I would say to believe in the person that 
you are, even if other people can't see who you are all the time. Um, and to connect with other people who have SM um, because you're not alone. And I know that SM can be a really isolating experience, um, but you really aren't alone. Um, and I mean, personally for me, learning and hearing the stories of other people with SM was really affirming and um, created this um, kind of love for other people, other people who have had my experiences. Um, and it also showed me, um, you know, I, I read in our own words, uh, which is Carl and Cheryl's book from I Speak. And that was like revolutionary for me um, to get to hear all of those experiences and, and see the similarities and the, the gaps that still need to be filled in the SM advocacy field. Um, so th those are the two recommendations I would have. And the last one is to know your rights, um, just to know that you are not a burden for having SM um, and people making space for you and supporting you and including you and meeting you where you are is not, um, that's, that's not, that, that's not, that shouldn't be viewed as a burden um, because you deserve support and inclusion. And you actually do have legal rights too, because um, <laughs> I, I include this in um, like a SM support guide that I'm going to be putting out soon. Um, but um, you you have right you have um, legal rights at least in the U.S. to work accommodations, to um, educational um, plans like 504 plans. Um, so I I just don't. I just hope that you know that um, asking for help, asking to be included is not too much. It's mm -hmm. exactly what you deserve. Wow. And what would be your key message for school staff? Um, hmm. I think I'm going to sound like I'm beating the same drum, but um, I, I really want to invite families and professionals and educators to consider different language around SM, um, rather than helping people with SM find their voices. Um, consider different ways that you can make your classroom a space where all of the expressions of your students' voice can be heard. So, um, you know, don't, don't discount um, you know, writing or using hand gestures. Like this was um, toilet for me, because I actually, I had a, a teacher in fifth grade who taught a sign language because she was an interpreter. So this was how we went to the bathroom. Um, it actually helped me having SM. Um, yeah, there's um, a really great link to 504 plan suggestions as well that I'm including in the SM support guide. So definitely check that out. Um, but yeah, I think the example of, of my teacher who took the time to um, meet me where I was that made all of the difference, like all of the experiences that I had um, in classrooms that were negative are, um, they're not erased, but they are healed by that, that one experience that I had with the teacher. So um, I really encourage teachers and educators and professionals um, to listen to the stories of people who have SM and, um, take our insights into account um, and to make space wherever you can. Well, thank you. And lastly, what would be your key message for parents who have a child with selective mutism? Um, ask your loved one how they would want to be supported. So I think a lot of times when you are a parent of someone who has, has SM, at least I've noticed this in the parents who have messaged me. Um, sometimes it, it's so like, you know, learning about SM can be so new. There's so much to learn. Um, there's so much that you might not still understand. Um, and the, like the field of SM treatment is still evolving. Um, so I, I understand there's a lot to um, stay on top of, but 
in addition to listening to experts and professionals, um, also take the time to have uh, an ongoing conversation with your loved one with SM, whether that's, you know, your child or your adult child or, um, or a partner or a friend even. Um, ask them, like, how, what would you like me to do when you're mute? Or um, how can I, how can I support you in general, even when you're not mute? Um, I think it's, it's really important to take a, the person's voice into, a, a voice and choice into account. Great. Thank you so much, Max, for sharing your experience. This has been an amazing video. So much depth. <laughs> to our discussion <laughs> um, yeah I'm sure it's going to be super useful for people to watch so thank you so much yeah. for having the courage to be so vulnerable yeah and <laughs> it's difficult but I you know I think it's important because of, of my own personal story I just think of you know I wouldn't want other people to experience the things that I've experienced unnecessarily right so um yeah that's why I tell my story Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and I'll put all the links that we've mentioned throughout this video in the comment section below, including Max's blog called Max Gets Curious, as well as the SM support guide that she mentioned as well. So thank you so much for watching and don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and check out my Facebook page, Confident Children Selective Movement Therapy, where I regularly share resources, videos, articles and everything SM. So thank you so much for watching and have a lovely day. Bye.